bonjour, good day, Nicolas. Bienvenue à cette activité de l'Association des économistes québécois. C'est techniquement la dernière activité, mais comme je l'ai dit tantôt, il en reste une autre le 24 mars, où nous allons couvrir le, la question de la fiscalité avec M. Euh, Godbout. Mon nom est Valérie Poulain, présidente de l'Association des économistes québécois, section de Montréal. Euh, Aujourd'hui, nous traitons un sujet euh, qui nous concerne tous, en tant qu'économiste, bien sûr, mais en tant que consommateur. Nous allons parler de la différence des prix au détail entre le Canada et les États-Unis. Au cours des dernières années, les statistiques révèlent que les Canadiens ont payé de 10 à 25 de plus que les consommateurs américains pour les marchandises, les mêmes marchandises, et ce, après rajustement en fonction du taux de change et des taxes de vente. Alors, il est légitime de se demander pourquoi, qu'est-ce qui est derrière ces écarts de prix euh, significatifs, est-ce que c'est le coût du transport, est-ce que ce sont les droits euh, et les tarifs, est-ce que c'est la différence dans les, entre les, règlements, les réglementations euh, gouvernementales. On va avoir réponse à ça aujourd'hui. Today, Mr. Lee uh, will explain the causes of this gap and the different actions that could be taken to fix the situation. Mr. Lee is Assistant Professor of Economics at the University of Toronto. He received a BA from Dalhousie University, an MA from Queen's University, and PhD from the University of uh, California, Berkeley. His research on Canada-US price differences has been published in leading academic and policy journals like the American Economic Review and City Hall Commentary Series, and has been cited widely in the media as well as the most recent Canada Action Plan of the federal budget. Mr. Lee, microphone is yours. Thank if, you it's, if it's high enough. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, merci beaucoup pour mon invité. Thank you, David. Okay, so, um, you know, my interest in Canada-US price differences it beyond, it goes beyond the academic. As a Canadian, you know, someone who grew up in Canada, lived in the United States for six years, and then brought an American wife back to Canada. So this is something that, you know, it's very salient, something that we discuss a lot in our household. Um, and, you know, part of my goal with writing this CD How uh, sort of paper was, you know, to take this from beyond a purely academic and just to like sort of a broader audience. Uh, you know, I think most Canadians are interested in this issue. And so if you think about, um, you know, why this issue has gotten quite a lot of press in the last few years, including a whole section in the most recent federal budget, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's clearly a very complicated issue of interest to academics because of this combination of market forces, right? I mean, firms set prices largely, and then, you know, what's the role of governments, right? What's the role of borders and the types of things that governments do? that might make cross-country price differences different than others. And it's got a lot of attention, probably because the Canadian dollar was very high. And so when you measure prices in you know, the price gap in, say, you know, measure a price in US dollars in Canada versus the US, a few years ago, those price gaps sort of reached record highs, at least you, know, going, you have to go a long way back to you know, the last time when the Canada-US exchange rate was near parity, and you found such large price gaps. So you know that's I think some of the momentum has come out of uh, moved away from this issue in the last you know six months as the Canadian dollar you know, worse. We said at 78 cents today, and suddenly those price gaps don't look so big now. But I want to convince you that actually it's still an interesting topic, and we shouldn't just be focused on like average price gaps. One of the other reasons I think this issue has gotten a lot of attention lately is you know uh, the growth of online retail. So it's now very easy for Canadians, even if you don't cross-border shop, to see what prices are in the United States. You know, especially on, you know, even on, both from online retailers, but even brick and mortar, there's more information than ever about uh, prices in different locations. Um, and I think the other thing that's, that brought some attention to this issue was the retail invasion of Canada, <coughs> sorry, where we saw the entry of a bunch of new retailers into Canada. So, I mean, you know, Target was an example of a not so successful entry, but there's other retailers that seem to be doing well. Um, and, um, you know, I think one story that was in the Globe and Mail a few years ago kind of epitomized the sort of the interest in this issue when uh, J. Crew, which is a U.S. clothing retailer, opened a brick and mortar store in Toronto. And previously all the, this is, you know, a clothing company that became very cool because Michelle Obama was like wearing these clothes. And, um, you know, my wife loves this brand too. So they, they opened the store and the Canadian consumers who were previously, they could only purchase this in the United States, or they were buying it from online from the U.S. were acutely aware of what the U.S. prices were, right? Because they were before they could only buy it in the U.S. The store opens in Canada, and like finally I can go to the store, you know, with the actual clothes, and you know the prices were 20, 30 percent higher in U.S. dollar terms in the Canadian store than they'd been previously paying. 
Okay, so this, you know, this was generating all this outrage, and in response, actually, the company, J.Crew, ended up cutting a bunch of their prices, subsequently, uh, in, probably in reaction to the media coverage and outrage this was generating. So this kind of brought, you know, together that, this combination of the high dollar, you know, more sort of active price comparisons, as well as sort of the entry of some U.S. retailers, saying that this was kind of an interesting area. And then the government sort of took note of this, so we had the 2013 Senate report, where you know, a bunch of people testified, provided a bunch of evidence on different aspects of this problem, made several recommendations, only um, one of which, to my knowledge, the, the government did anything about, which was a slightly changed tariffs on some items. I'll come back to that later. Um, the 2014 federal budget, they raised this issue again, sort of cited some of my research, and um, suggested that they were gonna task the Competition Bureau with doing something about it. And sure enough, earlier this year, the sort of proposal for the Competition Bureau sort of came out, which basically, I'll explain later, amounts to giving them some investigative powers, but without any obvious uh, uh, ability to, to sort of do anything substantive. But I'll come back to that. So what I want to talk to you about first is a little bit, very briefly, an analytical framework for thinking about price differences. Uh, I'll present empirical evidence that's drawn both from my own work, as well as other academics um, and some policy work, and then finally I'll talk a little bit about sort of recent trends and you know, policy, what we might be able to do about this. So in terms of the analysis, right, arbitrage is a fundamental thing that we care about when we're about economics, and arbitrage, the ability to you know, buy, uh, to take a good from one place to another, is really the thing that determines the ability of firms, right, or to charge different prices. Right? If it was costless to buy a good anywhere in the world and bring it back, all prices would have to be the same, in some sense, right? Now, arbitrage you know, is limited in the sense we know that even within, if you were to look within Montreal, let alone between Montreal and Toronto or between Montreal and Vancouver, um, they were gonna, you could pay vastly different prices for the exact same good. Right? Um, sometimes even on the same city block. You know, there could be two stores on the same block, and one of the stores is really nice, and one of them is kind of not so nice. Um, and they sell the same you know, product, the same barcode product, and you would see a price difference. Right? So when we compare those, when you think about you know, price differences in general, some of that may reflect amenities of, of the shopping experience, which is something you need to think about, you know, accounting for when you think about you know, what could be generating price difference. No one is surprised or outraged that you know, Walmart charges a, a lower price than if you were to shop at uh, Loblaws or Whole Foods or something. Uh, and your know, distance clearly makes a di difference even within cities, right? The fact that you can price differently in Montreal versus Toronto says, well, it's not just about national borders. Um, but then when you add the border element, we know that you know, when you cross a border, as a shopper, you face the sort of um, both border wait times or delays, whatever the cost is of you know getting a passport, as well as um, you're potentially subject to customs duties and taxes as well. So that's sort of a, a different part about crossing a provincial border, let's say, than a the national border. Um, and then online retail, well, in theory, you could buy anything. You should be able to buy anything that uh, you could buy online in the U.S. and Canada. But then we we know that there are um, you know, shipping costs, so that makes some difference. And if any of you have tried to buy some goods from the US, it's, there are sometimes cases where you're not able to. So if you try to buy online content, you know there's like geo-blocking where you know, they won't let you buy things from the US version. If you want to watch the US Netflix, you have to find some way around it with a uh, virtual private network. And similarly, there are some retailers in the US that will not ship to Canada. They will not ship to, a, you, you, you would need either a US address and or a US credit card. Uh, in order to, to, for them to ship the thing to you. So there are some barriers to this kind of online retail as well. Now firms, you know, firms have a much greater ability to arbitrage price differences across locations than consumers, right? Because firms, you know, they ship in bulk, they have a better, it's much easier for them to clear customs and deal with paperwork. So the fact that firms have this a greater ability to move goods across space and consumers is kind of what gives firms a, a pricing power across space, right? You know, it's just not a, you know, for an individual to sort of, you know, cross, uh, go to different stores and collecting all those individual items is very costly, but firms are able to do, take advantage of scale economies to do that much more effectively. Now, but on top of their kind of distribution advantage in terms of pure, you know, think transport costs, firms also tend to have, um, you know, restrict sales in some ways. So, you know, through licensing, uh, contracts, firms are able to limit uh, distribution of their products um, in some cases. Um, to some other firms. So we have a notion that the exchange rate is like the critical thing um, that sort of drives Canadio's price gap. So you think about you know, the nominal exchange rate, which is trading paper for paper, 
and the real exchange rate, which is conceptually is just the weighted average, right, of, of the sort of cross-country price gaps. So if you think about the real exchange rate, one would mean that on average prices are the same in Canada, US. If we know that these things move together, okay, we've known for a while. The old idea in economics, I think when we were mostly working with macro data, and there's a lot of attention on sticky prices, the old idea used to be part of the reason why these two things move together is that you know, the exchange rates move around a lot, the nominal exchange rate, and you know, the dollar prices and Canadian dollars or US dollars are sticky. Prices don't change that often, and so clearly that's gonna, you know, those, the exchange rate, the nominal exchange rate will move the real exchange rate one for one if the, not, if the nominal prices if I, that are sticky and are not moving. Um, so that was one of the old ideas that people had explored in the academic literature, but once we've gotten better access to sort of uh, micro data, so price setting at the level of individual products, it's become very clear that most prices or most goods change quite frequently. So it's not unusual for products to change prices every three, three to six months, and most uh, consumer products, are, are their prices would, would typically change every year. Which means that while this is important in the short run, there's no way that sticky prices could conceivably generate large price gaps that persist for you know, two, three, four years, as we saw in the most recent period of high prices in Canada. Now, if you were to look across products, you know, instead of just looking at this average price of like the entire consumer bundle, you'd immediately notice that there's a very wide dispersion of price gaps uh, across different products. So today, two years ago, at any point in time, there's always some products that are on average cheaper in Canada and uh, some that are cheaper in the United States. Um, but over time, it looks like this entire distribution of price gaps does move with the exchange rate. Now, if you want to think about the price gap now for an individual product, the price difference, let's say, between the countries, you can think about sort of decomposing that price difference into you know, what goes into the price. Well, first of all, there's a manufacturing cost, right? Let's assume this product is produced, the product could be produced in two different countries, it could be produced in the same country. So there's that manufacturing cost, and then there's some kind of a profit or markup that the manufacturer charges, right? And that determines what we as economists would observe as like the import price, if you're looking at customs data, or a wholesale price. So that's, wholesale prices are harder to observe typically, but we have some recent scanner uh, data, and I'll present some evidence on this later, we can actually observe some wholesale prices. Now retailer, you know, from the point of view of the retailer, the guy who's selling it to the final consumer, right, their, their input includes the, the wholesale price, the price they pay for the item, plus all their local operating costs, so the cost of land and labor, and you know, the electricity, they keep the lights on, um, and all those types of things, right? So they have, they have their own retailer costs, some of which is the manufacturer price that they pay, and then on top of that, they have their own retail market, right? That delivers the retail price, and the retail price is the thing that we see the most, right? The retail price is the thing that consumers see, um, you know, who don't go pouring through uh, statistics, like, you know, <laughs> government statistics, or have access to confidential data. Um, and then on top of all of those factors, right? So you think about there's manufacturer costs, manufacturer markup, the retailer cost, the retailer markup, there's the final element, which are like taxes and tariffs, right? Charged by the government. And so the things in bold are really the things that we sometimes observe, maybe not always observe. In some cases, it's actually very difficult to think about conceptually what, you know, what is the importer wholesale price. So take a vertically integrated company. You know, Apple is like importing, you know, iPads that are made somewhere into Canada. Um, you know, in theory, there, that which might show up in some kind of import price, right? But what exactly that import price is, is it sort of uh, transfer pricing or tax avoidance? You know, it's a price that Apple is charging to itself in some sense, so it's harder to interpret as in like an allocative economic price. Uh, so when you think about the, the sort of the broadly, you know, these two types of forces, the sort of profit forces, we think there's a role for competition and entry. And then when we think about the cost factor, we think about, well, this is related to input costs, including, you know, immobile factors. So things that don't move across Canada and the US that can't, that don't get arbitraged away that much, so land and labor in particular. But also, you know, there might be aspects of distribution costs that are different in Canada than the U.S. So many people have remarked that, in general, you know, distribution costs might be larger in Canada because fuel prices are higher. Uh, it's a sort of there's less scale economies; things are more spread out. Okay, so um, though, uh, finishing those theoretical preliminaries, let me say something about the empirical evidence on this. So let me keep track of time here. Um, so I'm going to give you sort of six facts about. Um, uh, Canada-US price gaps from data. There's three sort of data sources I'll use for this. And these are the three kinds of data we would want to use to sort of say something empirically about the nature of these price gaps. 
So the first are is government data, right? So data generated by Statistics Canada. So you can think about consumer and producer price indexes, uh, you know, import data collected by uh, customs. And in, in my case, I'm going to uh, use the OECD purchasing power parity statistics. Um, so the, this is data, you can go to the OECD website and download this, where for a range of OECD countries, you can get at a somewhat disaggregated level, basically relative price levels for different types of goods. Now, one of the problems with these government surveys is that, you know, think about the CPI and the KPI, their goal is to like track dynamic changes over time. They're not aiming to, generally surveys are not designed to compare prices across countries. And so one of the issues is, you know, when, when we think about, when we, when, in, in, when we compare the price that StatsCamp collects for one good in one of the US, it's oftentimes it's not the same good, right? It's not the exact same, because it could be a different brand, it might be like the store might be nicer that they're comparing it to a university. So you know, they, they have their sampling methodology, but it's not easy to, to really, it's not strictly comparing the same price for the same products within the same kind of store. So that's kind of the, the, the main limitation of the sort of government data. Now, the other source of data that academics have used is uh, scanner data coming from market research firms, so things like Nielsen, but also um, some of it provided directly by retailers. And this type of data is unique in the sense that sometimes gives us access to uh, cost data. So it's basically the wholesale cost, think about the input costs that uh, uh, firms pay. Finally, the, the kind of newest source of data that's you know, really an infinite source of data are online prices that people scrape from websites. So if you go to MIT, this billion, Google Billion Price Project, these guys are actually constructing real-time indices of inflation right, using continuously updated web scraping of US websites. And they've done this for other countries as well. Right, so you get like kind of you know, daily inflation. It, it, they, they show that it tracks sort of official CPI inflation that goes reasonably well. Um, and so this, is, so this is sort of an ongoing project and now we're getting to see some academic outputs for this. Although at this point, I mean, I think that it's also available to like people that want to pay for like, you know, some kind of analysis with this. Um, so that's a new, that's the newest kind of data. So I'll have some data uh, from those sources as well. Okay, so now for the sort of six facts. So the first fact, I think, you know, we're all aware of, so I won't play for this, is that you know, the Canada US dollar and nominal exchange rate is sort of both driving these average price gaps, right? And it's also um, highly, it's, it's basically being driven by oil. So, you know, this is a pretty striking graph if you look at the most recent period. Basically, since the, you know, 2000s, uh, you want to tell me what the Canadian dollar is, look at the price of oil. And, you know, sure enough, you know, that, that <coughs> of oil and the, and the exchange rate um, has happened in the most recent period. So. It looks like it hasn't always been the case. I'm not sure we have a good explanation for why that the, the dollar has been sort of so much more closely linked to oil, although maybe some people here have theories, not something I've studied in great detail. But um, certainly that's the sort of proximate cause of exchange rate movements. And then if you want to think about, you know, what's the relationship between the, ex uh, the nominal exchange rate and, and sort of price gaps. So, you know, when I say price gaps, just to be very precise, I'm talking about the price of the good in Canada versus the US in a, in a common currency. So 20% you know, means the price is 20% higher in US dollars, which is naturally also 20% higher in Canadian dollars. So the red line is tracking the nominal exchange rate, and the, the blue there is capturing the average price gaps based on, I think, largely Statistics Canada data. And you see that it basically tracks it extremely closely. It doesn't move exactly one for one, but these average price gaps they're measuring are you know, extremely uh, closely tracking the... So you see in the most recent period, you know, this period when there's been a lot of interest in this issue, so think about, you know, uh, in the 2010s, the, both the, the nominal exchange has been relatively high, those price gaps have hovered maybe around 15% on average. Okay, so the second point as well, so given that we have these price gaps, do consumers respond, right? What do consumers do? Is there much evidence that consumers arbitrage? Because if consumers don't arbitrage these price gaps at all, it's not surprising that there's these large price gaps. You know, how much are Canadians able to respond to those price gaps through arbitrage to potentially limit you know, the pricing power of companies across countries. So we have some interesting recent data. This is a study by uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Toronto and some co-authors at UBC, Ambaris Chandra. And what they did is they took the, the official data on same-day border crossings. Okay, so the blue, the solid blue line uh, is the actual, is the price gap. So if you look on the right axis, that's the sort of real exchange rate. So one means the average price is the same. You know, above means average prices are, are, are higher in, uh, in, uh, in, in Canada, and below one means prices are sort of higher, because below one means higher prices in Canada, above one means higher prices in the US. Um, and so you see that, you know, again, that closely follows the dotted blue line, which is the nominal exchange rate. 
But then if you look at that black line, what is that black line? That's sort of a measure of relative day trips. So it's basically how many people are crossing the border for the same day, coming back in the same day. So it's not all trips, but this is like basically same day trips, you know, at, uh, crossing the land border. The data, you can see that, you know, consumers certainly do respond. So in, that, in the most recent period, going into the 2010s, when things were cheaper in the US, so below one, more expensive in Canada, you see the number of relative trips to the uh, US trips into Canada relative versus you know, trips from Canada to the US um, measured by you know, point of origin, since obviously every day trip you're going across the border twice, um, uh, you know, tracks it very closely. So consumers do seem to be pretty responsive on some level, but then when you think about the actual magnitude of that, so this is a, a graph where basically, uh, think about you know, being, living in Niagara, so you're super close to the border, 24 kilometers from the U.S. border here on average. And what that on that uh, on the y-axis there is basically your predicted crossing percentage. So what is that? So that's about one percent you see for Niagara. That one that means that on average, uh, one percent of people in Niagara uh, are doing a same-day cross-border trip to the U.S. Okay. Um, and you see that you know, as, the, as the real exchange rate goes up in US dollars, so as things get kind of more expensive in the US, that proportion falls modestly. So you know, when things get more expensive in the US, less people in Niagara cross the border, but you still see a decent amount of border crossing. But you know, think about what the effective distance does. You go to Hamilton, just an extra 50 kilometers, and that, that border crossing percentage falls dramatically to about 0.25%. Uh, and in Toronto, 140 kilometers away, it's below 0.1%. So that extra, you know, 120 kilometers, not maybe not surprisingly, reduced the magnitude of border crossing by like, you know, a factor of 10, so considerably. And so, even though consumer arbitrage does seem to, you know, in terms of cross-border shopping, clearly responds to uh, these price gaps, the magnitude is small in part because you know many of the large Canadian population centers are just reasonably far from these borders. I was talking about David about this earlier today. I think in Montreal. The other problem you guys have is that Plattsburgh is not a very nice place to shop. Buffalo has more options, but there's less, uh, you know, there's even less sort of selection of goods there. So the motivation for cross-border shopping is even lower. Um, now, you might think online is a different environment. There should be way more arbitrage for online goods, right? Because, you know, they're going to ship it to you. And surprisingly not. So Shop Web Ed and co-authors had a paper where they looked at uh, prices, book, book prices charged by online retailers. And you see a similar kind of pattern here where the nominal exchange rate, that's the red line, over time is very closely tracking the, the relative price difference in a common currency. That's, those are those blue bars. So that even though, it, it, in the case of these books, you know, typically there's, there are no, uh, I mentioned some, some barriers earlier, but there's no structural reason why you couldn't um, ship a book from, from Amazon.com US. In fact, probably many of you have done that, um, versus you know, Amazon.ca. You see these like large price differences, even for online retailers, where you think the frictions are really small. Now, obviously, there are some issues with shipping that play some kind of role there. I mean, so books, there's no tariff issue. There is a, there are, there are some tax issues, but there's there's a shipping issue, right? So you know, there are, the shipping costs might be larger, but even when they account for shipping costs, they still find these large price gaps. So it, it's it's hard to argue that those price gaps are are, are only being driven by you know the the actual arbitrage cost. Uh, online consumers, which is, I think, a surprising finding, but one that other researchers have found as well in looking at other types of goods. Okay, so the third thing I want to say is there's a lot of variation of price gaps across products. So this, this, the focus on the average price differences might be somewhat misplaced, especially when we want to think about what are the factors that are driving these price gaps. And so this is from a Doug Porter at BMO. He, you know, he's done his own sort of little personal survey. Uh, this is, I think, from uh, like 2008, um, 2009. You know, price gaps for different types of products, right? So um, the the, far, the the rightmost column is the sort of percentage price gap in a common currency, and you see that you know the rate, the variety of price gaps is, is very large. So for some goods, like, uh, barbecue, the thirty-seven percent price gap, and for other goods, uh, you know, the Garmin GPS navigator, it's basically two percent, and there's even a there's even a couple of goods that are cheaper in Canada. So there's tremendous variation across goods when you get down to the you know, level of individual goods. So that's not just true for Doug's sort of small sample, 
Um, so a couple of uh, US academics did this for like uh, the entire set of sort of Nielsen categories. I think about all like mass merchandise kind of non-durable goods. Okay, so th what they did was they just plotted for every single price pair they could observe. What was like that, what's, like, what's the gap, right? The percent price gap across every price pair for like this, exactly the same item, the same UPC barcode, and then looking at, you know, what's the distribution of that? So, you know, what's the dispersion of uh, prices for the same product in, in, within the US, so that's the uh, uh, blue line. So you see it's pretty large. So there's a bunch of products in the US that are 50%, you know, 100% more expensive than you could find somewhere else, right? That's on that exact, so 0.5 means 50% more expensive. Within Canada, you see a sort of a fairly similar wide dispersion. And then when they look across the Canada-US border, so now they're just using price gaps, instead of using all price pairs within a country, they're using only price pairs across countries. It actually doesn't look like the cross-border price dispersion is so much different. So they interpreted this as evidence that actually there isn't like any kind of border effect. But you know, I think two things to keep in mind. Um, one is that you know they're not at all accounting for the fact that people may be buying goods at different types of stores. So maybe the, you know some of these U.S. goods are more likely to be purchased in like not in stores that are not as nice as stores in Canada. So they're not controlling for those retail amenities. But more than that. Um, they picked a particular period of time. So this is for 2003. In 2003, the average prices were pretty similar. So it's actually not that surprising that in 2003, this pattern looks, uh, that the pattern of cross-country price gaps would look similar to the pattern of price gaps within a country. If you fast forward a few years, the picture would begin to look quite different. So here's another graph just showing that, that distribution of price gaps, again, centered at zero, Right, but with like a bunch of things, uh, you know, a bunch of mass in the tail. So a bunch of, those are the, the larger price gaps. This is based on the online web scraping. So these are other types of goods. Here, these are products, all the products that you can, you know, buy online through Apple, Ikea, H&M, and Zara. And so you see that, you know, there's, there's kind of a, for some of the goods, for, for some of these categories, like uh, Apple and Ikea, there's, sort of, there's a spike at zero. So there's a bunch of goods that are in this, even in this 2008, 2013 period, where like at zero price gaps, but then there's a whole bunch of products that have uh, positive um, price gaps. And in general, things look like they're more expensive in Canada in this period for these online retailers. Um, you know, what's interesting about the online comparison too is that here, you know, when you compare the online prices, we're, we're taking out all those local costs, right? I mean, those, the, those price gaps can only be given by distribution or shipping costs. There's no issue of you know, paying higher wages or land rents uh, like you had here you know, for the different brick and mortar uh, stores. So there's a huge variation of price gaps. Um, so we might ask sort of what's driving them, right? So what's driving, why do some goods are more expensive than others? Um, and what's sort of driving that movement in the retail price gaps over time? And one of the things that I think is most interesting that we've sort of learned recently as we've got more micro data, the old, one of the old explanations for why, you, you know, you see these large price gaps is that, you know, a large part of the cost of any good are these local costs. Right? local not traded costs, so the price of land and labor in Montreal, and that, you know, land and labor in Montreal are not freely traded with like land and labor in, in, in Plattsburgh, right? So one consequence of that is that since all those costs are going up when the, when the nominal exchange rate changes, right, in US dollar terms, we're not surprised that that's something that might generate those differences. Yeah. But in, in fact, economists have known for a long time that, you know, if you were to look at sort of, you know, price indexes that capture more or less traded goods, so compare like a producer price index and a consumer price index, or compare, you know, sectors that are like more likely to be services versus tradable goods, economists have noted for a while that actually the, the, the non-traded stuff isn't actually, the, the traded goods relative prices, the traded good price gaps behave a lot like the non-traded good price gaps. That actually is not a question of sort of non-tradedness, you see these price gaps even for like among the most traded components of goods. So that's one of the things that, that you know, came out in the, the Senate report is a lot of Canadian retailers were like, well, we're charging higher prices, but it's not because we're making great profits. It's because we have to pay more for the, our, the goods that we import. For the, we have to pay higher wholesale prices. So they presented this evidence in the Senate report. So these are not consumer prices, but are wholesale prices. These are the prices paid by U.S. versus Canadian retailers for like identical products. And they, you know, presented evidence that many times Canadian retailers are paying dramatically higher uh, prices for these goods. So you can see, you know, in some cases, you know, up to double the price for certain types of goods. Um, and, you know, in, in some of my own research, we've sort of done this for basically goods that you buy in a grocery store. So, 
uh, not, not all the, the same types of goods. But if you look at goods in the grocery store, uh, the top two panels are basically showing you the distribution of Canada-US price gap. So we take the average price of Canada and the average price in the US, right, in 2004. And 2004, you see, it's pretty symmetric. So there's some goods that are more expensive in Canada, some that are more expensive in the US, but on average kind of zero. And then by 2007, with the dotted line, you see that it's kind of shifted to the right. So now, on average, things are more expensive in Canada, even though there's still a subset of goods that are cheaper in Canada. Now, the bottom panel, the bottom two panels there, are doing the same thing, but instead of with retail prices, we did it, this is with the wholesale cost. So this is kind of reflecting that, you know, there's this distribution of wholesale cost, and the whole distribution of wholesale cost has also shifted uh, right over time. So as things got more expensive in Canada, at the retail level, part of, you know, one of the major things driving it was that the wholesale costs uh, were rising as well for those retailers. Now, if no, suppose you just concentrate on like just uh, two regions here. So we just looked at Washington State and <coughs> British Columbia. Okay, so you know, these, these regions should be pretty comparable. Many dimensions are right across the border from each other. And then over this period, the green line is the exchange rate. And you see that both the retail and the wholesale prices at a sort of quarterly frequency, those price gaps seem to pretty closely track the exchange rate. So not only does it look like it's really the wholesale, you know, the most traded part of that good you buy is like the wholesale price, right? Not the local labor and land. Not only does it look like that wholesale price is sort of driving the movements over time, but actually if you look, so these are for the subset of goods that we could exactly match that were sold in, you know, the identical goods sold in uh, Canada and the US in the same retail chain. So providing exactly the same level of service and amenities too. Um, what you see is that the, the price gap, the retail price gaps are a little bit smaller than the wholesale price gaps. In other words, if you were to sort of try and finger the blame here, it doesn't look like, at least in this case of this particular retailer, that they're taking advantage of consumers. If anything, the retailer is actually getting a slightly lower markup in Canada than the US, right? They're swallowing some of that difference in the higher wholesale costs. That's the fact that the blue line is below the red line. Now, if you were to look at these sorts of uh, retail and wholesale price gaps within a country, so it was kind of a placebo experiment. We compare like prices in Washington state to Oregon. You know, do state borders affect these prices? And you see that basically they don't. So whereas with the national borders, we see this big dispersion of prices, and as you can see, you know, the average price uh, deviating from zero across U.S. states, it looks like you don't see any of these types of factors. Now, one question you might have, you know, when I when I think about Okay, so if it's the wholesale cost, the, the price of, of like say producing and distributing that product, well, is it because all the Canadian goods are being made in Canada and all the US goods are being made in the US? Right? Because if that was the case, if all of the goods we buy are manufactured domestically, then it's not surprising that you know when, when labor costs go up and land costs go up and input costs go up because the Canadian dollar is, is uh, appreciating, it's not surprising that the, the, the manufacturer price, right, the wholesale price would also go up because it's being produced locally. Um, so, that, so, so that, that would be one possible explanation that says, you know, it's, it's not about manufacturer profits, it's actually about manufacturer costs. But when you look at, um, when you sort of uh, look at the, so the black line is the relative labor cost over this period of Canada, so they're going up, right, as the Canadian dollar appreciates from 2004 to 2007. But then if you look at the domestic, goods that are domestically produced versus goods that are U.S. imports, the behavior looks quite similar. In other words, that increase in cost doesn't see, seems to be similar whether the good is manufactured in Canada for Canadian consumption or manufactured in the US, which suggests that it is something about the pricing power of manufacturers and not about sort of manufacturer cost per se. Okay. Now, the fifth kind of interesting fact that we've uncovered, and this is one that gets less attention, but it's sort of uh, one that I think about a lot, is uh, there's actually quite a large Canada-US variety gap. And this is a, a general problem when you want to think about comparing prices. Is like, it turns out that the share of product, the products we consume in Canada on average are actually quite different than the ones in the US. Um, so this is kind of surprising. Some of this is because of the way that we sort of measure product matches. So think about like Coca-Cola. You know, a bottle of Coca-Cola you buy in Mexico and the US are actually different, right? The Mexican one has more sugar uh, instead of high fructose corn syrup. So you might, you might want to try and match those, but they're really not the same good. So this is adopting the strictest definition of really the exact same good. Right? There may be many things on the Canada where they like tweak the, la the packaging or the label a bit, and there, you know, those might not be treated as the same good. It's not clear exactly how we should you know, think about those, because there might be some minor differences in ingredients or whatever. But if you think about the share of common products, so this is basically the, the leftmost panel here is looking at 
across US cities. I'm sorry, it's, it's kind of small, so you might have a hard time sort of seeing what they say, but basically on the x-axis is distance, right? On the y-axis is the share of uh, identical products that you can find in both areas, okay? So, you know, one thing is, you know, being further away means there's less products in common. So New York and Boston have more products in common than New York and LA. That's probably not that surprising. But the share of products that are in common across these US cities is, is, is actually not that high. There seems to be a lot of uh, regional and sort of city level diversity in the types of products that people purchase. Now, if you do the same thing for um, Canada, that's the rightmost panel, you see that the share of products, these are now for Canadian provinces, the share of sort of common products is much higher, but you still see this kind of distance effect. So, you know, Quebec and the Maritimes, or Quebec and Ontario, more products in common than like Quebec and uh, British Columbia. But, so, so, you know, we have sort of, it seems like we have less brands in Canada overall, and so we have less kind of regional variation than they have in the US. Now, the middle panel is a comparison of, you know, between a, like a Canadian province and a US city, how many products do we have in common, and you see that's just extremely low, below 10%. Okay, so um, it seems to vary a little bit with distance, but not that much. There's not so much of a downward slope in that graph. They're just really big differences. Now, you might wonder how does that translate into like your experience as a consumer? Because obviously, like a Canadian province, you know, maybe there's just different goods available in Quebec City versus in Montreal. You know, province is a really big area. So think about your experience now as like a shopper going to like a supermarket of the exact same chain. And here, this is from some of my own work, you know, the x-axis is telling you how big is the store. Not surprisingly, bigger stores give you more product varieties. No one, few people will be surprised to learn that that's true, at least for, you know, stores of the same grocery chain. And the y-axis is the number of distinct products, so the number of, like, distinct barcode products you have. And one of the things that is striking, you know, so the average uh, store in Canada, you see it maybe has about 8,000, 8,500 different distinct unique products in, in this data set. Okay, but a US store of the exact same size is gonna have closer to like uh, 12,000, right? So, I mean, you could, you could sort of calculate different ways, but it, it works up to about, you know, 20 to 30% gap in variety. So we're talking two stores of the same chain of the same size, you go to the store in the US, and you, there's 30% more product variety. So what does that mean? Well, either we have nice wide aisles in Canada, <laughs> they're nice and low, or you just get lots of repeats, you know, you get, eight rows of the same cereal. In the US, you know, you maybe get two rows per cereal. Right, so that's, um, you know, that's a striking thing, but that has implications for price gaps too, right? So not, we think variety gaps might matter for consumer welfare in general, but it, it also says something about the extent of competition in the marketplace, right? The more varieties you have competing, um, the more competition there's across manufacturers, right? The more likely they're gonna price competitively, they're not gonna be able to sort of uh, price discriminate like that. So then the last sort of fact I wanted to talk about sort of a little more big picture across categories and think about, you know, broadly the types of uh, explanations we have. And I, this is going to be a little bit less um, sort of precise than some of the things I had before. So this is going to be based on uh, Statistics Canada data uh, from this OECD project as well. And so think about any type, category of good, right, may have higher load distribution costs. So that's one of the factors we think, right, that could affect price gaps. The level of competition can matter, right? And the, the last thing is the government intervention, right? So these are the three things that I think that are the three main explanations, sort of costs, so including distribution costs specifically, right? The level of competition, so like profits, and then government intervention. All explanations for the price gaps more or less boil down to those three types of things. So, so this is from, uh, so the really detailed data I, I can only get for the, from 2005 to 2011 here. So I wanted to focus on the, the 2011 column which is a period of you know, peak uh, Canada-US price gaps, right? So the dollar is at parity in 2011, and look at the different categories of goods, and, and so that number there, 1.76, and you're not reading that wrong, or 176 says that a, uh, you know, meat costs 76% more in Canada than the US in that year, and milk costs 77% more in Canada than the US in that year. Okay, so those first two categories, I, you know, I, I, I've come to Quebec to talk about this, you know, there, there's a, there's a some interesting reasons for those, right? So those goods are unique in the sense that those are the only goods where we don't really have free trade with the US, right? We have uh, huge tariffs and quotas. Basically, those are NAFTA exempt goods. So, you know, when you think about those types of goods, there's high distribution costs, right? Milk is like expensive to move around. It's because it's, it's not that valuable relative to the movement. There's probably low brand power. People aren't super, you know, one kind of milk is good as another. There's no like brand power. They come close to like how we think of agricultural commodities. So there isn't really brand power. 
Um, there's high distribution costs, but then you have those huge tariffs. And you get very large price gaps. The next set of goods, you know, fish, fruits, and vegetables, they're actually very, they should be very similar to, uh, uh, you could throw pork in there too if you wanted. So those things would be like very similar to, uh, they should be very similar to meat and milk and eggs, right? Because they have basically very little brand power, they're like commodities. And they also have a very high distribution cost because, you know, food has a high distribution cost. But those goods have zero protections. Those are the zero external tariffs and they have zero NAFTA exemptions. So not surprisingly, the price gaps for those goods are dramatically smaller. Right, so if you want to think about you know, how large is the effect of like, supply management in Canada and those policies uh, for those goods, you can see that it accounts for most of it. Now, those prices are still higher. So you know, there might be local costs, local distribution costs and things that can still generate a 20% price gap, but they're not going to be able to generate a 70% price gap. Right? For that, you need government intervention. So the next set of goods I want to talk about, these are goods where there's essentially low or zero tariffs. Um, so other, like think about like branded goods, so bread and cereal, non-alcoholic beverages, other foods. So these are more like processed food. These are things that are produced by major multinationals and they're less like commodities. So those goods have also have high distribution costs um, and they have very low tariffs, but they actually have more brand power. Okay, so these are the types of goods where it's actually, you know, uh, what, what the, the government calls country pricing, but basically, you know, I'm Coca-Cola, I am, uh, you know, Post, uh, General Mills, one of these companies. And you know, basically, uh, you know, relative to fish and fruit and vegetables, it should be similarly expensive to ship as like these other types of goods. You know, you see larger price gaps for these goods. So, you know, how what's a contribution of like market power and this sort of price discrimination? Well, you can get a sense that maybe it's on the order of you know twenty to thirty percent, right? It's a difference in the price gap between the the goods where which are like commodities and the goods for which is like brand like manufacturer power. Finally, there's the other types of goods that are relatively low distribution costs, right? So alcohol and tobacco, because they're expensive relative to uh, the shipping, right? Um, and as well as, you know, uh, clothing and uh, uh, things like furniture. I mean, furniture is maybe sort of moderate in terms of the, and host home furniture is probably somewhere in the middle in terms of distribution costs. So those goods, um, you know, they have less distribution costs. They tend to have brands and market power as well. So that plays some role. But those are categories that also benefit from uh, a, a government protection. So those are those, those are industries, you know, alcohol, tobacco, especially, you know, super regulated. I mean, the government basically sets the minimum price, right? So uh, for for alcohol. So those are goods where you could lay a lot of the blame on the government, in particular, um, in terms of driving those cross-country price gaps. So now to give you a little longer run perspective, since you know uh, this was of interest, this topic was more of interest when the price was. Uh, when the price gaps were close to one. So here, this is like a longer run perspective, going back to 1992. So, you know, here we are today at about points, I guess I should round up, it's like 0.79 today, but we're about 0.785, right? Um, the exchange rate, and so you can look back at some of those periods when we had sort of exchange rate at similar levels. So 2005 isn't too far off. 96 was like a little lower, you know, 92. So, you know, that's we're kind of in that kind of world today, okay? And if you look at, the, what's called the actual individual consumption, which is like everything that a consumer consumes, you know, when we're, that's, we're kind of at that level where the average price gap works out to be close to one. Or, you know, so that, that 100 means that the prices are kind of the same. So we're, today we should be in a world where the price gaps are, are close to zero. Um, however, that hides a lot of differences across types of categories, right? So if you look at food and beverages, even when the, when the average price gap is zero, those things are more expensive in Canada you know, uh, 10 to 20% pop, potentially, right? So those things are gonna be more expensive. Alcohol and tobacco are gonna be more expensive. Clothing and footwear are gonna be more expensive and household furnishings and equipment are gonna be more expensive. Right? so what's gonna be less expensive? I didn't show those things there. Things like actually education and healthcare are the, are the two major consumer items. And maybe transport to some extent that are cheaper in Canada. Now, so this is for more micro data. So this is again, just to talk, think about the magnitude of the effects coming from competition versus the magnitude of effects coming from government intervention. Okay, so this is a scatter plot of basically, on the x-axis is like the ratio of uh, manufacturers in Canada relative to the US in the retail data I have. So above one, so to the, towards the right of that graph, these are categories where actually there's a lot of competition in Canada. So breakfast sausages and ice, I guess. We have, we have many brands of those things. Um, you know, uh, Asian food as well, right? We have more Asian food. This is, I should be clear, this is comparing Vancouver to uh, uh, BC to Washington State. So maybe that's not surprising. Maybe there's less Asian food in Montreal, I don't know. Uh, 
or probably a decent amount. So you see that, first of all, most categories have much less competition in Canada than the US. So most categories are below one. And if you were to do draw a regression line through those in terms of the y-axis should be explained. The y-axis is how much did prices rise during that period of Canadian dollar appreciation from 2004 to 2007. You see that being at a more competitive industry did moderate the rate of price increase. So like, you know, the, if, if I'm in a category where there's like the same level of competition as the US, prices only went up by 10%. If I'm in a category with much less competition, maybe they went up by more like 15%. So there's kind of a modest effect coming from that. Now the red dots are the supply managed categories, right? The NAFTA exempt categories. And you see that those goods, not only do they tend to have less competition in Canada, which may not be surprising, but they tend to have even higher rates of price increase, even given the level, the number of competing brands that we observe. So, you know, there you can see that those goods, that maybe adds another five or 10% to the rate of price increase over this period. So just a word about tariffs, right? So I, just, I sort of mentioned that uh, under NAFTA, US and Mexico, uh, produce items are exempt, except for those categories. But, you know, th thinking about free trade with the U.S. is the wrong way to think about it because most of the goods we consume, you know, many of them are not produced inside of NAFTA. So if a good is produced outside of NAFTA, what happens? So, well, when you bring it into Canada, you have to pay this tariff, which is not produced in NAFTA. And that tariff is like 18% on a lot of clothing, uh, apparel, and textiles. Furniture and appliances is maybe around 9%. For food, it's, it varies. So, you know, it's 11% for prepared meals, 5% for cereals, uh, you know, infinity for... <laughs> or like 200% for uh, you know, uh, supply managed categories above the quotas. So there's a big, uh, so the, you know, those tariffs are, are considerable in some sectors. When you think about what tariffs do, right, there's a direct effect of a tariff when you think of, okay, it's just like a tax that increases the price of the good. But there's also these indirect effects. So one indirect effect is, you know, the high tariffs prevent more entry and more competition by foreign firms, right? And we get, end up getting more domestic production, right? And what more domestic production does means that Costs are even more tied to local costs. So we're gonna see even more you know, price gaps being driven by the dollar because the more, a larger share of the good is being produced locally. And the second indirect effect, and this is kind of more subtle, tariffs allow multinationals to price discriminate. Right? So if I think about, you know, set, I'm, suppose I'm a clothing retailer, I wanna set a price in Canada and the US. Right? Um, you know, I could set the same price and pay the same tariff. Make, we might have roughly similar tariffs in Canada and the US. We could set the same price in either one. But I could set it up to like an 18% higher price in Canada than in the US if I have an 18% tariff. Why? Because, well, if the Canadian consumer wants to bring the good in from the US, they have to pay that tariff again over some amount. So, so you know, tariffs uh, are, are actually allowing, and one of the mechanisms that allow um, uh, these multinational firms to price discriminate if they want to. Right? They don't have to, but it gives them that ability because it limits consumer arbitrage. Okay, so finally, let me conclude a little bit about what's going on recently. So we've been following the retail scene in Canada, it's very exciting, right? So Target failed spectacularly, Walmart keeps growing. We've had a bunch of new clothing retailers. I don't know how much in Montreal, but Toronto, it seems like every six months there's an announcement some new place. You could think of that as evidence that there are competitive forces, right? So we see entry, there probably were higher profits for a bunch of Canadian operations in this period. And, you know, we see entry. So that's, you know, that's how economies are supposed to work. So even though we had high prices in Canada, for a while, maybe some higher profits, you did see some entry by pro additional products and retailers, and we helped lower that variety and competition gap, and over time, that's gonna help erode some of those profits. Now, the other big thing, it may or may not have much to do with cross-border price gaps are these big mergers, so Sobeys and uh, Safeways, uh, Blah Blahs and Shoppers, and that's it's a little harder to think about what, what that would do for price gaps. On the one hand, it's going to lower distribution costs in Canada, right? Part of the reason Walmart is so cheap is because they have really good logistics and it's partly by being so big. On the other hand, there's an additional effect, right? Um, that they might be more likely, these larger firms may be more likely to introduce sort of private label goods, so goods that are like store brands. And one of the things that those goods may do, and I've some work sort of looking at this issue, those goods may lower, they kind of increase competition across manufacturers, right? They might get rid of some of the some of the pricing power that like Coca-Cola has or Post or General Mills uh, might get eroded the more President's Choice and you know, whatever uh, products you have on the shelves. Um, on the other hand, there's also been some recent talk about you know, retailers getting so powerful that they're squeezing suppliers asking for lower prices, which is anti-competitive in some sense, but probably good if you're a consumer. Then the other big development is online retail keeps growing, right? So there's some evidence from like eBay prices that, they're, that, that uh, at least on eBay, Right? eBay, often there's like thin markets. eBay is a classic problem where arbitrage is hard. 
you know, I collect the Princess Diana Beanie Baby or, you know, Tickle Me Elmo from five years ago, and like, there's not that many people who are gonna collect that, so it's not a thick market. Um, but, you know, online, suddenly you can, you know, get a huge market, everyone who collects your weird random thing, and as a consequence, you know, the price gaps for those types of products are probably gonna fall dramatically as a consequence of continued online retail growth. It's a policy. Um, what can we do about this? Well, tariffs and supply management, I don't, there isn't really much talk about doing anything on supply management, but in response partly to the Senate report, the federal government cut tariffs on some goods. Right? So they cut tariffs on something like hockey equipment was one of the big ones. Um, I guess that's you know, the, the appealing to the hockey uh, dad, hockey mom demographics um, that Harper was targeting with that budget. <coughs> Um, so they cut price tariffs on some of those products that you know had high, pretty high price caps. Now, of course, what they didn't advertise as much was that they raised tariffs on, on a bunch of other products. So actually, the, the, I think the net fiscal effect was close to neutral. I mean, some of you may know better than me, but essentially, they, you know, they, they cut taxes on things that they thought would be political winners. They raised tariffs on things that they thought would be, you know, well, they wouldn't hurt as much. And so there hasn't really been any big change in Canadian tariffs over this period. Now, just for reference, if you wanted, wanted to think about well, you know, we don't want to get rid of, forget about the effect of the protecting Canadian producers. Let's say we just care about the fiscal effects. Um, eliminating all tariffs would be like a 1% GST increase. So every good would become a little bit more expensive, but certain categories, like the ones I detailed before, would see dramatic price differences. Cross-border shopping, well, many of you might be aware that they increased the exemptions a few years ago. So if you're away for over 48 hours, you can bring back $800 of stuff. Now, the, the, the exemption is still zero for same-day trips. Right, so theoretically, a same-day trip, in practice, as you know, they don't always stop you, but in theory, you pay you know, GST on all these things that you bring in, and you pay full tariffs if you were to like, buy clothes. You pay that 18% tariff, too, in theory, on a same-day trip. But you have up to $800 exempt. Um, so they've done quite a bit on the border crossing. There might be talk about raising that more. Now, the, another policy that they mentioned in the Senate report, but the government hasn't sort of touched, is a, this a de minimis tax or duty exemption on postal shipments? So think about you know online retail. It's a future. You're ordering things online. Um, in Canada, if you have a shipment under twenty dollars, you actually don't have to pay GST or duties on it. So you buy some computer cable, you're good. Now, uh, if you go over twenty dollars, theoretically you have to pay the full duties if it's a item with tariffs, and you have to pay the, the taxes on it. Um, Canada's unique in having a super low exemption for this. So the U.S. exemption is two hundred dollars. In Australia, where I guess the people love to import things from other places, it's a thousand. So we're a real outlier compared to you know some somewhat comparable countries, and that's a policy you'd be nice to see them revisit. Now that's a policy that the retailers really don't like because they don't they want the government to rank to, to force U.S. manufacturers to sell them goods for cheaper, but they want to capture those profit margins. They don't want to compete with like U.S. retailers uh, more. But that's a, a a policy that I think is worth considering, especially considering how far out of step we are with our neighbor. Finally, this competition bureau policy. So the federal government, um, they recently, what was this reform? They empowered the competition bureau to essentially investigate and request data from companies on sort of their costs if they're suspected of what they call country pricing. So what they call country pricing is charging a higher price in Canada that is not justified by the costs. Okay, so think about that for a second and think about what that is sort of economically but also operationally, right? So first of all, all they've done is just empower them to investigate. Supposing they find that a company is doing this, it's still not clear what exactly they will do. The punishments are very unclear. Now, supposing you know you could, there are no uh, enforcement issues. There's still an economic counter argument to this, right? So, one of the things that price discrimination can do is potentially is increase consumer surplus. So, those of you who kind of remember like I/O theory, um, whether or not price discrimination is good overall for social welfare depends partly on whether price discrimination increases the quantity you sell or not. So no one's saying we should not allow movie theaters to, to you know, not discriminate against seniors or students or whatever, right? because we know that if, if, if they weren't allowed to price discriminate there, they might end up increasing prices uh, overall, like the average price they pay, and a lot of seniors aren't gonna go. Right? So if they can get a senior to go who wasn't gonna go by price discriminating for them, that's actually a net social welfare gain. Okay, so price discrimination may or may not be socially efficient, and it may or may not be good for consumers. Um, you know, with free entry and reasonable levels of competition, like we have in, in many categories of goods, it's not exactly clear what the economic rationale is for price regulation, especially by a you know, pro-market conservative government. It's surprising that they went this route of sort of regulating, attempting to regulate prices, in, at least in this indirect way. 
And just to give you one example, right, think about this J.Crew entering example. So J.Crew enters in Canada, charging a higher price in the U.S. You know, are we better off because they opened a brick and mortar store? Yes, we still are, because you know, you can still go and buy it in the U.S. for the lower price. So, you know, that's a case where, you know, if they weren't able to charge a higher price to justify their entry, they might be worse off, and we might be worse off, because having a, you know, a high-priced J. Crew store is better than having no store. Right, so there's an effect on entry that you need to take into account as well when you assess this. But of course, the biggest objection to this legislation is a practical counter-argument. Right, so defining what exactly is justified by cost is extremely difficult, you know. We think about marginal cost, average cost, what about multi-product firms? Do they have to, you know, do they, the costs have to be similar across all these different items? Are they, are they allowed to charge, you know, if they sell one product below cost, but another one above, how does that work out? Well, what about vertically integrated firms? So they're not really selling anything, they're just transferring the good internally, so like, what is the cost there? And then of course, you know, exchange rate volatility. So, you know, you said you write one-year contracts, six months later the exchange rate fell by 10%, because the oil prices fell, you know, now suddenly, you know, you are you are not engaging in country pricing. It's kind of a it's it's a serious uh, uh, practical hurdle to implement like that. Okay, so I've got a little over, so maybe I should st uh, stop there and take some questions. I have like one more slide if you want to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me give you okay, so let me give you a um, the last kind of policy. So this is the one that's definitely not on the horizon. But think about uh, this is from this is from uh, this is I think I find this study fascinating, though I'm so not sure how to interpret it. So think about deeper economic integration, right? So we talked about like tariffs and border delays. So one possibility would be to move to like what you have in the European Union, right? A common market. So what that means is we have a common external tariff, same as the US, but basically there's essentially no border. So free movement of goods within. Okay, so that's one thing that you might want to think about. And the other thing that I think is more extreme or maybe taking it further is like the common currency, right? So like the kind of Euro approach. Now, <laughs> Here, this is from this, the same study of these online retailers. So this is like Ikea, Apple, Zara, and H&M. So those are the goods in the sample. So what they did is they thought about, these are the price gaps relative to Spain. Okay, so Spain is in the EU and on the Euro. And they compare, look at the price gap. So look at like, so a bunch of countries are also in the EU and on the Euro. So Austria is in the EU and on the Euro, Germany, Finland, Netherlands, France. So you see that in this, with a common market and a common currency, those price gaps are very small, like it's centered at zero. Almost all the price gaps are zero for the online pricing. Okay, you know there's big price gaps with the US, but they got a different currency, different stuff. Now, look at the, there's three European countries that kind of stand out there, right? Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Well, you know, they're, they're different. So Norway is, for, for, per, is not completely in the common market. So they're not in the common market for agriculture because they're not in the EU but they are for, for all of their goods. And Denmark and Sweden are in the common market. So they have zero trade barriers. The only difference is that, you know, well, Norway and Sweden have uh, like uh, floating exchange rates against the euro. But Denmark, Denmark uh, has, a, has a fixed exchange rate that's only moved within 0.5% of the euro for like the last, I don't know, 15 years since they started this European <coughs> exchange rate mechanism. So Denmark has a fixed exchange rate it's part of the same market, and you still see much wider dispersion of prices than you had. So I find this really puzzling. I mean, one way to interpret it is that basically there's some kind of mental or psychic or accounting cost of like price setting that you know that that is different when you're in a different currency, even if the exchange rate is fixed, and that that is generating some degree of price dispersion. I mean, really puzzling. I mean, the other thing I don't think they test this enough in their paper. You might think that people like rounding up prices that end with like 99 or. <laughs> 499, but that's unlikely to generate as large of the price gaps as you see, right? I mean, those kinds of rounding issues, currency to make a price look nice and round, you know, you can see that making, you know, four or five percent price gaps, but not some of the large ones you see there. So that's really puzzling. And then they have one more uh, examination of this where they now they look at these are price gaps relative to the US for a whole bunch of countries. Okay, and so these are a, a lot of these countries. So, first of all, none of these countries have any kind of uh, free trade or anything. So there's tons of uh, trade barriers with all these countries. But some of these countries are, are dollarized, and others are only pegged to the dollar. Right? So all of these countries have at least like a peg to the dollar, like a fixed exchange rate over this period. But two of them, El Salvador and uh, uh, Ecuador, are actually fully dollarized. So they use the US currency as legal tender there. And you see that those two countries kind of stand out as having relatively small price gaps compared to these other countries. Which again suggests that there's something about currency 
that plays an important role here, and not just you know volatile exchange rates, but even just the currency of pricing that makes some difference for firms' pricing decisions. Now, you know this is only they're only for four online retailers. It's not clear how this generalizes across other contexts, but I think it's kind of fascinating when, when we want to think about sort of deeper economic integration as one way of reducing the magnitude of these price gaps. It suggests that you know the common market alone may not be enough. Um, then we might need a, also need a common currency if we wanted to reap the full gains in terms of minimizing those price gaps. Um, okay, so that's sort of all I have today. I'm happy to like take questions and continue discussion. So thank you very much for inviting me. I hope uh, you found this interesting. Hi, really interesting, really complex. When you compare uh, meat prices between Canada and U.S., does it include beef and pork? Because the, these meats are not uh, under supply management. You're right. Yeah. So I believe. So that's. So I think in the stats can category. So we go back here. I believe. So I, yeah. So I think. So meat includes. Uh, it includes beef, pork, and chicken. So it sort of includes them both. So I agree, that's, in, in that sense, we're kind of mixing some supply and demand stuff with some not supply and demand stuff in that category. That's one of the reasons I tried to show you this graph. So this is just uh, buttermilk and like poultry products. Um, so the, the red dots there are like excluding other types of meat categories. Um, so there, you know, so you still, you see, you see a similar type of pattern there. Unfortunately, the StatsCan data doesn't let you go more disaggregated than me. It would have been interesting to break that down, but uh, not, I wasn't able to do that with this data. Um, so yeah, you have to think about how, I don't know what kind of weight chicken has and like total uh, consumption relative to those other goods. There are some tariffs on, uh, on meat though. And they're, I guess mostly external, but. But they're really small. Yeah. They are exporting to yeah, the yeah, US, so. No, so that's It's right. really interesting. It's, it's yeah. That's a fair point. Um, yeah, it would be nice to look at uh, that separately. Uh, yes, sir. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Do you think, or do you have any proof or evidence that the price gap between two countries can vary depending on the revenue per capita difference between the countries? You know what I mean? Like, you mean like, think that like income charge? per capita? Yeah. yeah, so that's a hard thing to, to, to measure in the sense that, you know, like all, like when the, when the Canadian dollar like appreciates, right, all labor costs go up, but so do income, right? So it's like, it's kind of the combination of both, right. thinking about was driving it. Um, the, the best data we have on like income effects comes more from like comparisons like within a country, right? So you want to compare like, or even just you know like neighborhoods where like you think maybe those wage effects aren't as high because like the people who work in service in rich neighborhoods, you know, come <coughs> from poor neighborhoods, and then but they have higher incomes. So you do see you do tend to see this pattern that income. I mean, there's some evidence from like a cross section of like you know rich and poor cities or neighborhoods. That, that firms charge higher prices in, um, in in richer areas, so people have more income. Now it's hard. It's, again, it's hard to interpret that because, you know, probably the stores in the rich neighborhoods are also nicer in some sense. So it's it's. I, I don't know if we have great like a, you know what we really would like is like some kind of experimental evidence where, you know, a bunch of people suddenly got like income transfers and you see how much of that gets sort of taxed away by you know retailers taking advantage and raising the prices. There is a little bit of evidence on that, I think, but not so much for uh, uh, rich countries. So people have looked at that a little bit in developing countries, where you know there have been some recent reforms, like sort of welfare cash transfers, and there there is some evidence, especially if you're in like a remote village or area, that you know that increase in income sort of generates like a shift in demand. If you think about your classic, you know, demand and supply, right? Uh, if, unless supply is, is perfectly elastic, you, you're going to see some increases in prices, right? There's going to be some capture of that increase in income going to like extra producer surplus and profit. So there's some evidence consistent with that in that context, but I haven't seen you know, something that would quite reach that level in the US. Although there's some interesting work with like gasoline prices. Yeah. So the thing about gasoline prices, it's a shock to your disposable income, and probably there's not much substitutability. So like an increase in gas prices is almost like, for a lot of households, just like a negative income shock. And so we do have some evidence of the like sort of sales respond to that. So when incomes go down, firms do sort of price more aggressively. So there is. But it's, it's hard for me to make a definitive statement about like the magnitude of that, like how much that would be driving cross border prices. Thank you. Good question. No? Bonjour. Oui. Uh, yeah. Just want to know, uh, I think the uh, present situation 
can be explained by your data from previous years or and like the uh, exchange rate was low or yeah so like if, if I were well so first of all the gap the the, the decline in, in the exchange rates happened fairly quickly so I would you know I would say give it give it another year and around this level and I, my prediction would be we're going to fall somewhere between the 92 and the 96 level now so, so back to the 90s I mean some other things have changed in that period which makes it a little bit harder to be definitive about that but you know uh, based on the car level I think that's that's probably our best guess for what uh, you know price gaps would be for individual you know, types of products would be looking back historically at what the current exchange rate is. I, I been there isn't much evidence that there's sort of a, a major trend difference, which you know, would think would be interesting, right? If we like, it's not like the past because somehow Canada is sort of more different now. I mean, my guess is it probably it is something of a trend, but it's hard to see the data. There's no like big definitive trend where you know. The price gaps are converging over time, or you know, irrespective of the exchange rate. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I would like to do research on that. But I'm not sure what I don't know what's changed in the sort of retail environment in Canada versus the U.S. Other than sort of online retail, it's not obvious what would be so different. I mean, maybe we have a bit more competition, but I mean, so does the U.S. We both have WalMarts since the early '90s. We have more WalMarts. <laughs> Yes. Thank you very much for being with us and not being at the Commission on Municipality. <laughs> okay, that was good. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming.